Hello, I'm Wayne Wallingford, State Representative for District 158, and welcome everyone here for Child Advocacy Day. I got to meet uh, Tracy a, a couple years ago and heard her story, and it was very moving, and I was very interested in it, and fortunately we tied up together again last year, just about this time, and we've been working as a team ever since. I'm new to this type of role, and I was in the Air Force for 25 years, so I kind of look at things a little differently sometimes. In respect to youth justice, I look at where have we been, what have we learned, and where do we go now? You know, we incarcerate children for a mixed bag of reasons, rationales, ones that not always are right when considering the punitive dimensions of juvenile incarceration. The landscape of juvenile incarceration is complex and has increasingly become misguided over the past three decades. Consequently, we see contradictions everywhere. The conditions in juvenile corrections often remain harsh, a sign of both cynicism about rehabilitation as well as neglect. States have quickened the pace of expulsions of juvenile offenders to the criminal courts and prisons as a way to get tough. These patterns of growth in juvenile correction suggest ambivalence about reform and rehabilitative rehabilitation of juvenile offenders. Getting tough on juvenile offenders has thus been assigned to the criminal courts and the adult correctional institutions. What this all adds up to is an institutional landscape that fears child criminals and wants to punish them harshly. But even short-term exposure for youths to adult prisons has risks for youths. The transfer of minors to the criminal courts was a reckless experiment. A robust body of research shows that recidivism rates are in fact higher for youths sentenced as adults. Thus, there appears to be no marginal deterrent effect from incarcerating minors as adults, which was a cornerstone of youth policy in the 1990s. One possible explanation for the elevated recidivism rates may be the effect of adolescents' exposure to prison life and adult convicts. Studies compared the correctional experiences of youth in prison and juvenile incarceration all agree that placing youths in prison comes at a cost. They are less likely to receive education and other essential services that are more likely to be victims of physical violence. Unfortunately, states have toughened its juvenile delinquency code to de-emphasize rehabilitation and focus on punishment. This getting tough was outsourced to the criminal justice system with states more often than not using regular criminal law for juveniles. States were amended to, statutes were amended to ease and expand the number of youths transferred to the criminal courts for sentencing as an adult. Between 1990 and 1997, every state in America modified both its juvenile and criminal codes to expand the number of youths eligible for transfer to the criminal courts. This strategy was designed to increase punishment in numbers and severity. So what have we learned? Well, I've learned that the complexity of state laws and the piecemeal character of the statutory landscape need to be fixed. Kids are different than adults. This relatively new social science research on adolescent behavior and development supports the observation that kids are indeed different than adults. They're more impulsive, have slower developmental immaturity, they're vulnerable to peer pressure, less likely to reason judiciously about risk, less likely to understand short-term actions versus long-term consequences, and youth seem to need more stimulation. So now where are we going to go? The philosophy of child saving is important. I believe deeply in child saving. 
we have two choices. The first choice is that we need juvenile centers that emphasize rehabilitation, not just to basics such as education, but to new models for working with children and their families to sustain therapeutic successes beyond the time of correctional confinement. I said we have two choices, so what's the other choice? The other choice is typified by institutions that are violent, abusive, and sadly indifferent to the essential developmental interventions for adolescent offenders where intervention is secondary to punishment. That is no place for kids. Youth incarceration does not work. Dozens of recidivism studies from systems across the nation have found that these facilities fail to place youth on the path to success. Real funding rates for youth released from juvenile correction facilities are almost uniformly high. There's compelling evidence that our nation's heavy reliance on youth incarceration does not reduce offending by the confined youth, provides no overall benefit to public safety, wastes taxpayer dollars, and exposes youth to high levels of violence and abuse. Within three years of release, around 75% of youth are rearrested. Low and moderate risk youth placed into correctional facilities were five times more likely to be incarcerated for subsequent offenses than comparable youth placed in community supervision programs. Incarceration at a young age not only increases the risk of future incarceration, it mortgages the long-term prospects of young people for employment and social stability over a lifetime. Incarceration affects carry forward, knowing that we have to ask ourselves if the social harms of incarceration of young people will someday in the future be revisited on their children. The good news is that even though they display the characteristic development immaturity that I talked about earlier, they also have a characteristic called changeability. In other words, they are still developing and are more amenable to rehabilitation as compared to their adult criminal counterpart. It costs $88,000 to incarcerate one juvenile for one year. Early intervention that prevents high-risk youth from engaging in repeat criminal offenses can save the public nearly $5.7 million in costs per individual over a lifetime. I've been talking a lot about the juvenile justice system, but I don't think that describes the system fairly or accurately. I think a more accurate descriptive word is the juvenile legal system because I don't believe our youth have received justice. Fifteen percent of all students will come in contact with the juvenile justice system. As society, we want our children to be healthy, safe, happy, and connected to, in a loving, positive way to other people. And as parents, we do whatever we can to ensure those outcomes for our children. Those who work in the social services share the same goals for the children, youth, and families. Unfortunately, individual workers do their best in this regard. They are often significantly challenged by the systems within which they work to achieve outcomes we want for our children. In the beginning, I said we I'd talk about where we have been, what we have learned, and what do we do now, and where do we go. The where do we go now part requires action by each of us if we are ever going to get there. We need to reinvest, realign. We need to combat ambivalence and resistance. It will require internal change agents as well as external change agents and especially advocacy groups like Families and Friends for Reform of Juvenile Justice and Missouri Juvenile Justice Association along with the working division of uh, working alongside the division of youth services. Thank you for being here. This is something that needs to be addressed 
and this is the forum to do it. I appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Wallingford, because um, my name is Tracy McClard, and I am the founder of Families and Friends Organizing to Reform Juvenile Justice, or for John. Uh, Jonathan Daniel McClard was my son. Uh, when he was 16 years old, he was certified as an adult and sent to serve 30 years in an adult prison here in Missouri. Within seven weeks, because all hope was stolen from him, we lost him. Um, he died in the adult prison system on January 4th of 2008, three days after his 17th birthday. Um, because of this, I resigned my job as a teacher and I began FORGE. Um, and with me today are all of the families behind me who have been affected by this horrible system that we have um, going on in the state of Missouri. The thing is, the state of Missouri is considered a model state, and it is a model state. There is part of Missouri's juvenile justice system and part of Missouri's system where cert kids are certified as adults that are models, that are good. Other states will come and um, learn about our model and try to implement in their own states. The problem is that not all kids have access to the system. Um, we now know since these harsh laws were enacted back in the 90s and they've spread so much across the nation that kids should never be treated as adults. They should never be placed with adults. They are not adults. They will never be adults. Um, studies and statistics prove that treating them as adults, incarcerating them as adults is not working. It's having the opposite effect. Kids recidivate at higher rates. They grow up and they will never be the children or the adults that they would have been if they had been treated as children when they were children. Um, and there is a proven better way that does work. The Representative Wallingford mentioned the Missouri's Department of Youth Services that run um, well-researched, well-founded programs in the state of Missouri where children are treated as children. They are rehabilitated, families are totally involved, and they get the education services they need as well as paying the retribution and rehabilitation. Um, so because Missouri's way is proven and highly successful, Forge Missouri is fighting to make to help all kids in Missouri have access to this program because once a child is certified as an adult um, they have to go through several channels to have access to this program and not all children are given that that chance and that that treatment um, as are as was my son and the parents that stand behind me and the youths that stand behind me have all been affected by Missouri system that is not part of the Missouri model so um, I am going to turn this microphone over to a youth that actually serves time in an adult jail here in Missouri, and his name is Owen Welty. Hi, my name is Owen Welty. I was 13 years old when I got arrested and certified as an adult. I waited trial for two and a half years in adult jail. I spent 10 months in solitary confinement and 17 months in general population with no protections. 821 days and I was acquitted. I want to talk to you all today about why children should not be in the adult system. My personal story is tragic but it's not an isolating event. When I was in the adult jail I had no access to education for nearly three years. In the state of Missouri the juvenile system is better equipped to handle kids provide the necessary treatment kids need and to be held accountable. From my personal experience, I believe that kids cannot be kept safe in adult facilities. I hope that we can create a better future for kids in Missouri. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jamon Carter. I'm here to, um, today I'm here to talk to you about the issue of kids in the adult system. I have experienced both a juvenile justice system and the adult system. Uh, while incarcerated at the Department of Youth Services, I received my GED and attended college. I received the services that I needed to understand why I was getting into trouble. 
I paid I paid restitution to the victim to my victim and was held accountable for my actions. Uh, and I was responsible for my behavior, attitude, chores, laundry, and food preparation. In adult facilities, there is no accountability. There is no education, no services, and I can even attend church. Youth language in jails are not and are not given proper tools uh, to make positive changes. At the age of 17, I was placed in an adult jail with a cellmate twice my age and size. I was the youngest person in the jail and was housed in general population without protection from adults. Uh, I was bullied and often had to fight for food. Um, children should not be placed in facilities because we are neglected and stripped of our childhood. Um, I was recently released from a, from a county jail and will have a, fe a lifetime felony conviction on my record. Uh, I will forever be stigmatized by, by this felony on my record. Finding a job, housing, and um, financing my future will be a struggle. Please consider making positive legislative changes to keep children in adult facility, keep, keep children out of adult facilities and in the juvenile system where we are held accountable and get proper rehabilitation services necessary to become productive young adults. Hi, my name is Kelly and I'm the mother of a boy who started uh, his freshman year in high school and um, never came home one day after he also was put into the um, uh, adult system as a youth and he was uh, one week 15 and um, he um, died uh, at the age of 24 in the adult prison system and there was nothing we could do to help our son. He had a mental illness and it was not um, tended to and he was not cared for by um, the system. And there was nothing we could do, we had no recourse. And what would have helped us is if the laws were changed and he was not allowed to be treated as an adult from the very beginning. And so it's our heart and our um, mind to work to affect that change so that no other children would suffer. And that would be our son's wish because he often said that the only reason he could think of that he ever had to experience this in his life was so that no other child would have to. So um, I just thank you for hearing, especially from the youth who've been affected, and I pray others would have a heart uh, to change a system that is harsh and abusive to our children. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori Welty. Uh, my son Owen was 13 years old when he was incarcerated. And I just, I feel strongly that these teens should not be housed in an adult facility at all. There is too much of a danger for them to be in this facility like this. They are exposed to sexual, mental, emotional, physical abuse every day while they're in there. And it shouldn't be happening at all. No child should ever have to be faced with making decisions that even me as his parent couldn't make. We, we just can't do it. And we should not expect our kids, our children, not to do it either. We can't expect them to. If we was to put a child in danger, like the system is putting our children in danger today, we would be in a lot of trouble. I don't feel like it's right that the system can do it. And I mean, this, it shouldn't be done, period. I trust that the stories you've just heard have affected you and helping you to at least think about what's wrong with our system, what needs to be changed. Forge Missouri is working on with Representative Wallingford to introduce a bill this week. The bill will address Missouri's dual jurisdiction program to give all children in Missouri access to um, the programs and services that the dual jurisdiction program can offer for kids that are under 18. Thank you so much, and I hope to have your support, and we will talk to you soon. Let's forge ahead. 